Good evening, everyone, uh, to this last panel of the day. So it's good to see uh, quite a number of people, and I see some still coming in. Uh, my name is Jan Ellermann. I'm a senior specialist in Europol's data protection function, and I just wanted to uh, briefly welcome you here to this Eden panel. If I could have my slides, please. Exactly. So to briefly introduce our concept, so uh, this event here is part of Eden, which is, and Eden, the beautiful name you may know as a garden, but Eden is not a garden. It's the Europol Data Protection Experts Network. And um, we are really privileged to be here because not only are we, of course, the most exciting data protection event in law enforcement, but we also have a history here at CPDP already. So um, it's the fourth time in a row since 2020 that we have the privilege and honor here to participate in uh, CPDP conferences. And for, for us, that is really important um, uh, at Europol to be part of the debate, which all of you are an integral part of. So Eden is all about um, uh, debating uh, how we can get it right, how we can ensure freedom and security. And uh, with that, um, I would only like to invite those of you who enjoy what we're going to uh, do here with you today. There's another opportunity to join the next Eden event in sunny Madrid on 18th and 19th uh, of September. That's going to be a one and a half day conference all about uh, data protection and law enforcement. And with that, I'm going to hand over to the moderator of this panel, which is Els de Bissa. I'm not going to moderate because also for reasons of gender balance, uh, you would uh, uh, see that is wrong, also for other reasons. But Els, please welcome and thank you all for being here. Enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jan, for uh, putting together this, this wonderful panel and for having me as a moderator here. So I'm Elze Busser. I'm from Leiden University in the Netherlands. And I'm happy to welcome many of you. I'm sure that there are still some people coming in, because I see many people in the back still. Um, for this last panel, which is basically separating you from the cocktail, so I, I realize the vulnerable position that we're in. But we do have some quite essential things to talk about. Um, what we're going to focus on with this panel, I will introduce the speakers to you in a second. Uh, we're going to focus on gathering data, obtaining large amounts of data, but we're also going to take it um, a bit, well, let's say push the moment a little bit forward and looking at prevention, because you know it's not just about gathering data that are there, it's also about preventing data from coming into the picture in the first place. And uh, for that reason, we have our first speaker. Let me first run you through the entire panel, and then I will give them the floor. Our first speaker is also from the Netherlands. Uh, Wouter Kleinzoon is here from uh, Team COPS, which is a very appropriate uh, acronym for Cyber Offender Prevention Squad. Uh, by the way, this is a small um, um, uh, change in the program because his colleague Floor Janssen was uh, uh, supposed to be here, but she couldn't make it, and we are very grateful that Wouter was willing and able to jump in at the last minute and uh, be here with us today. Um, he is just like a floor like his colleague, part of Team Cops, part of Team High Tech Crime. And uh, he will talk to us about prevention and deterrence and the key challenges for law enforcement in a digital age. Then we will move on to a UK perspective. And next to me is uh, Pete Fuzzy, who's a professor at the Department of Sociology at Essex University. He focuses on human rights and emerging technologies. Um, he will unpack with us the UK perspective, and that will segue us into um, our next speaker, which is Helen Gibson. Um, mm -hmm. Helen works with the Center of Excellence in Terrorism, Resilience, Intelligence, and Organized Crime Research at Sheffield Hallam University, and she will broaden the scope to the EU and post-Brexit um, UK perspective. And that will bring us to our last speaker uh, sitting um, in, in 
in the corner on my left here. Jürgen Aimner is a Deputy Executive Director of Europol with a specific responsibility for governance matters. And he will um, zoom in on what it means to gather large amounts of data and how law enforcement's job, how their work has changed in the past uh, few years. So without further delay, I gladly give um, the clicker as well as the microphone and the floor to our first speaker, uh, Wouter, the floor Thank is you. yours. This is the clicker, right? Not, not remote yes. control to a bomb. It's <laughs> massive. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so yeah, I work for uh, the Netherlands police uh, in a very original team called the uh, Cyber Offender Prevention Squad that was uh, we, we thought of that name during a barbecue indeed, uh, but we focus on offender prevention of cybercrime. And as law enforcement, um, we focus on um, uh, investigating data breaches, on arresting offenders. All these types of uh, interventions help, I guess, uh, um, privacy. Um, but prevention is better than cure. That's, that's what I often hear from colleagues. And uh, it's often much more efficient. And you can focus on victim prevention, which is usually the first type of prevent, well, the first thing that comes to mind if you think of prevention, right? Prevent uh, victims be from becoming uh, victimized. But if we invest in offender prevention, it's much more efficient as victims is very, it, well, cybercrime is very large skill and there are many victims, not as many offenders. So if we can deter them away and disrupt them and and we divert them to positive alternatives in an early stage, then we can be much more efficient. And not only as law enforcement, but also for the private industry, for public partners. That's what we try to do with our team, with the COPS, the Cyber Offender Prevention Squad. We try to initiate this sort of movement um, from getting people to, to invest in offender prevention. And that's what I will show you, what I will show you today. There we go. So I forgot to put in my lenses, so I will just look in here. But um, this is quite an original statement that we made three years ago when we started with the uh, with the cops in the in the police, because my colleague said we arrest and prosecute. That's what we do as police. But we think it's 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 different, and it's it's also uh, more urgent than people often think. Because if you look at cybercrime, and then uh, we see that offenders are getting younger. Motiv motivations are different. Um, before before joining the police, I worked at probation, and I often spoke to to offenders, for example, that entered a gas station with a gun, and then they they uh, asked for money, basically. And when I asked them why did th did you do this, their response was not that they wanted to check their security, that they wanted to see how far they could get, or that they wanted to show how good they were at robbing gas stations. But when I spoke to uh, young hackers. Uh, or just simply youngsters dedosing their school, their their arguments were seeing how far I can go because I could, because I wanted to check security. So we are dealing with very different motivations that law enforcement is not always used to. And as our interventions are not always responding to in the right way. The criminal justice system is not in itself, in the Netherlands at least, um, ready to respond to these, these kinds of offenders. Um, if you check the, for the risk factors of traditional crime, it's often stuff like uh, financial problems, drug abuse, uh, some problems back home. But if you speak to these offenders of cybercrime, youngsters, etc., uh, they are living at, with their parents in the basement. Uh, they go to school. There, there are no problems if you check the traditional uh, criteria. But we still have a problem because they are still committing crime, and there are huge, there are huge impacts. But their awareness about this is not always there. We, so it, then there is a crime, and there is a big investigation, and there is a team committed to this for a year, and then you end up in a basement with a 17-year-old kid, and he goes to court, and then the judge responds, "Yeah, why, why did you do it?" And then he said, "Yeah, because I didn't know it was, it was, it was criminal." Um, and then they get away with uh, a short sentence or... Uh, so it, it, it's very strange if you look at the impact and, and the amount of uh, investment from law enforcement and then eventually what happens. We are not, um, as law enforcement at least, we came to the conclusion three years ago, we are not um, using our 
capabilities and capacity in the right way. We should focus more on preventing that so that we can focus our uh, capacity on the right people that we have to arrest and prosecute. Uh, and the last point why we should focus on this is the parity between offline and online interventions. Traditionally, in offline, you get many interventions. If you, you're, you're not born as a criminal, but if you steal some candy in the shop, somebody will respond. And if they don't do it either the first time, they will do it the second time. So you have to all these interventions, and eventually you will go into the justice, uh, justice system, and then you might end up somewhere down, as a, down the road as a serious offender. And online, this is not the case. People on forums are not telling each other, well, not often, they are telling each other, look, this is illegal, you can't do this, you have to do a responsible disclosure, you can't DDoS your school. So it's very different. I always compare it to taking a brick. If you take a brick and you throw this through your school's window, people will react, right? Your fellow, your, your peers, they will, they will be surprised at, at least. Uh, the teachers will be mad and they will call your parents. And again, if, you, if, if the same kid sends a DDoS to his or her school, because they don't want to do the math exam the next day, their peers, they think they're cool because ha, we don't have to do the math exam. So they get excited. The teachers, they have no idea what's going on. This is very generally speaking, right? They don't know what's going on. They will definitely not call the police. And their parents, they think they have a bright future in cybersecurity. So there's a, there's a big change there, how we react to these types of crime, also in law enforcement. So that's why we want to invest in offender prevention we are actually not the first country to do this. The UK was actually. The National Crime Agency started uh, a team about 10 years ago. And um, right now, there are uh, several more countries involved within Europol uh, to join this movement, to, to, to come up with interventions and to do this together. Because we're only a tiny country, so we have to do it with other partners. This is my, well, my, my very far away boss. This is the head of the uh, National Investigation Unit. And I like to quote him, of course, if it's a quote in our favor. He says, prevent without pursue is toothless, and pursue without prevent is endless. That's what it actually comes down to. We are not saying we should only do prevent, because it's useless. If we're only barking, nothing is happening, because eventually people return and they will ignore us. But if we are only pursuing, it is endless, and we, can't, we can only use our capacity once. So if we combine this, if we pursue where necessary, and when it's the last resort, we have to do that. But let's combine it with prevent so that we are more efficient and that we reach, reach more audiences and, and amplify towards those risk groups because we can't arrest ourselves out of cybercrime. That's a fact. We are losing that battle. And that's why we started the COPS. On the left, you see how we like to see, uh, to, to look at uh, how, how we like to see each ourselves. Um, this is what we look like right now. Um, <laughs> I like to show this picture because I want to show it's a very diverse team. It's not the traditional law enforcement officer. Uh, it's not only tactical or digital capacity. There are people, uh, there are psychologists involved, criminologists, uh, people from the ethical hacking community. It's a very diverse team because we have to look at the problem from an holistic point. And that's the team. It's, there's a few, there are a few interns in there and uh, we are growing. Uh, last week, a, um, a, um, juridical specialist joined us because that's a big question. How far can we go? What can we do? What can't we do? How can we use the data? So that's how we started, sort of a startup within the police. And our methodology, I'll just check with you, how, how am I going time-wise? Fine. I'm fine. Yeah. This is our methodology, the 4D approach. That's basically what it comes down to. We are saying you can do prevent by doing these 4Ds. Deter, divert, degrade, and disrupt. And it's sort of a sliding scale. You can focus with deter, deterring them away, informing about uh, illegality, and divert towards positive alternatives. Because as I said with my example of a gas station, in this case, there are actually positive alternatives. You can use these, these skills that you're excited about. You can use them in a positive way, as long as we are there early enough. So, this, so these two, two dirt, so, sorry. First two Ds, they, they are sort of the softer approach to, uh, towards prevent. Deter and divert those interested entering or engaged in low-level cybercrime. Be there early and divert them away. When people progress down that, down that pathway, down that sliding scale, we degrade and disrupt those committed to cybercrime. This is not new. It's new that we call it prevent. But disruption is, is something the police has been doing for years, of course. 
But if you combine it, you, you can focus the disruption on the ones you can't get to. You arrest the people you can get to and you can actually arrest and prosecute them. And then the big bunch around that, the customers, the people interested, they are they're the ones experimenting, deter and divert those. Then you have the whole, the, the whole bunch. Uh, there we go. And then this is what we basically do. We use a, a pathway. This is a very simplified version, but this is what we see how people progress towards serious cybercrime. We spoke to offenders, we did lots of debriefs, uh, lots of research in this, and this is what we see. We see people active online and then they start gaming. Of course, we're not saying that everyone gaming is a criminal, but we are seeing that people that they don't end up at the end that are criminals, that at one point in their life, they were very uh, much dedicated to gaming. So it's a way to get closer to your to your audience. And then also, if, you, if you're gaming and you, and you go onto platforms about gaming, looking for mods for Grand Theft Auto, for example, you're also exposed. You're also exposed to to different types of uh, of hacking, of modifying. Maybe you go from uh, modifying Grand Theft Auto and then to your to your neighbor's doorbell, which is a very small step, but that's the step towards crime, right? That's what we, that's what we use uh, to come up with interventions because an intervention all the way at the end that's not suitable for some person at the right begin very beginning. I won't go into detail with all of these. It, what it comes down to is uh, we focus on primary prevention, big campaigns focusing towards the general public, and then you go towards secondary prevention, which is focused towards risk groups, different type of interventions. For example, using Google Ads to, in Google Ads to advertise towards people searching for details. Very simple, very small interventions. We can advertise with keywords and we say, this is, this is illegal and these are the consequences. Very tiny intervention that we otherwise wouldn't do. And then uh, we've, we we organize a reboot camp focusing to our, on, um, on 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 these risk groups, and we invite them for a day of uh, uh, lectures by cybersecurity, police, etc. Sort of this fun day, but we still give them that message. All the way at the end, hack right is a uh, a criminal um, uh, intervention in the justice system. It is sort of the digital way of collecting garbage on the street, but then you can learn something. I actually wrote a video. I hope there's audio. This is just one of the example. It's a very one, one very, very start. Uh, primary prevention that we um, that we focus on um, high schools, I guess, in English. So between 12 and uh, 17 years old. It works. Als we nu niets doen, lopen we het risico dat een hele generatie cybercriminelen opgroeit. Teenagers are unaware that their online behavior could risk their own future. How can we make sure they don't exchange their high school diplomas for criminal records? Framed is an immersive mobile experience and innovative teaching method that transforms the school life of teenagers into a personalized and thrilling cybercrime story. Meet Anne, a popular schoolmate who reaches out to you for a small, friendly favor, but this innocent request quickly turns into social pressure as the story escalates. Anne persuades you more, but the more you help, the more you cross the line of cybercrime. Framed is built with a custom engine for branching storylines. Every choice you make creates a different path, leading you to three possible endings and even an arrest. For this native experience, we've crafted hundreds of GIFs, photos, chats, memes, and voice messages. With POV video and several AR components, the story comes to life. Framed was introduced as an easy-to-use free curriculum for every Dutch high school and was an instant hit. The personal experiences sparked cybercrime conversations across classrooms. I found it spannend to om the cijferlijst te veranderen. I had never thought that I would have to get a straf plaats zou kunnen krijgen. Anne liet me wel dingen doen die ik niet wilde. Door dit succes hebben meer middelbare scholen framed as lesmateriaal geselecteerd for het komende schooljaar. And daarmee kunnen we echt het verschil maken. By creating a personal experience, Framed lets teens realize the consequences of their online actions. So, the next time a schoolmate asks you for help online, what will you do? So just one example. The fun thing is at the end, you end up with a criminal record that shows this, the, the, the crimes you committed and, and what it means if you would actually do them. So. I will wrap up. My point from law enforcement in the Netherlands is that the best data protection is to prevent the data from getting breached. We can protect vulnerable youngsters, we can deter them, we can divert them, 
and uh, we can also preserve talent, which is quite original in this in this area, I guess. Thanks. Thank you, Walter. Um, there's applause. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And we will move immediately to how technology can be used in a responsible way, and then the UK perspective. So, Pete, you have your 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you, um, and thanks for the introduction. Okay, I'm just going to talk um, about two things broadly. Oh, that's gone all the way. How do I go? Um, I'm going to talk about two things. So, I'll just briefly introduce myself very quickly, just to say that I'm not a data protection lawyer, which will be very apparent once I start speaking. Uh, I'm a social scientist, I'm a sociologist, that a lot of my work focuses on how the police use technology or how technology is, is shaped and shapes the environments it's placed in. So I led the independent human rights review of the Met, Met Police trials of facial recognition technology, for example, and spent a lot of time on, on facial recognition surveillance operations and lots of ethnographies with police in the UK and the United States in particular. So hopefully I'll, I'll try and just sort of bring, bring a couple of uh, different uh, thoughts to the table and I really want to sort of look at it from that kind of more sociological perspective rather than restating a lot of things that probably many of us already know. Um, so hopefully do something do something slightly different. Uh, Jan asked us to think about four questions um, for this panel so I'm going to pick the middle two. So the first one about sort of responsible uses, just got four points on each really. Um, so one is obviously the discussion around ethics and rights, which is kind of rehearsed to death. I come from a human rights perspective and the, tends to be quite traditional to bath, bash ethics-based approaches around kind of, you know, notions of uh, the way ethics are often a, a very normative framework or subjective in, in many, many regards compared to human rights. One of the arguments, the arguments about ethics washing and, uh, and so on. But I think really <coughs> rather than just rehearse all of those debates, which are in part a little bit tired, one thing I, I would think that's really interesting in this space is as technological adoption grows throughout law enforcement in particular, um, we see a, an upscaling of technology, but actually ethics approaches generally aren't that scalable. Um, I know there's people I can see in the room who are on UK policing ethics panels. I'm on a few and there's not many people that do this kind of work. So you can't necessarily upscale and adopt increasing amounts of caseload. So there's an issue about scalability and sustainability. I think um, the other thing um, I would say on this as well is the second point is really about when we think about using AI responsibly and legally I was I've always been struck by how diverse and how uneven knowledge of the law is in law enforcement there are people that are very very clued up and you know extremely knowledgeable about the the minutiae of, of human rights law but there's an awful lot of people that are not and it's extremely uneven. I think if I was to sort of distill from the literature and my own research, I think there's a couple of common themes. One is the way in which a legitimate aim and necessity are often conflated in law enforcement. Obviously, in, in a human rights test, they're, they're separate things. Um, the other is the way necessity is often misinterpreted as something is necessary to help me achieve my goal rather than the necessary in a democratic society. And the other thing which I think is, is, is particularly challenging for law enforcement is around proportionality. You know, among, when we start to think and unpack what proportionality is and start getting into discussions about the utility of a measure versus a harm, it becomes much more complex and speculative when we're talking about leading edge technologies, both in terms of its utility, which often overstated by technology vendors, but also the harm. And certainly another branch of work I, I do is on the chilling effects of surveillance in, in the developing world at the moment. And it's quite interesting when we think about what the audits of potential harms are and how, how they're generally quite focused around Article 8. Um, so that's the sort of issue around, um, uh, around sort of knowledge in policing. The third point there is about surveillance arbitration. So I wrote a, pa a paper with uh, a colleague called Surveillance Arbitration. This is really, it's, it's not original to me, you know, it's an old idea. The idea about what happens in the gap between technological innovation and, um, and regulation and the creation of, of legal tools or regulatory tools. So the regulation versus tech, that space. So everybody says, well, there's a space between these things. 
And so we did quite a bit of research looking at how do frontline operatives, people using different digital technologies, how do they negotiate that space? And it's I found it really interesting in the way that often a lot of the rights-based um, sort of commentary is that the police will use a technology in a very licentious way, there'll be a lot of state overreach and so on, which is also true. Um, that that does happen. But then also we observe the opposite effect. Uh, I'd be interested in the law enforcement perspective on this, that if there's insufficient regulations or rules or guidance, that sometimes the police won't use technologies that they are legitimately and legally entitled to use because of fear of litigation or, or some other kind of censure. So in a way, I'm trying to disrupt this idea that regulation is somehow anti antithetical to, to public safety. Actually, regulation can enhance public safety um, in that way. And then um, extra procedurality. I think there's been a couple of panels I've, I've seen which have, have talked about this. You know, we often talk about technological uh, expansion. But as technology expands, also there are opportunities for extra procedural ways of, of, of accessing or, surve or conducting surveillance. I think there was a panel earlier today that talked about data brokering, the availability of, of data on the commercial market. Um, my own work has looked at... Sorry, <coughs> looked on uh, you know, watch list constructions for facial recognition and so on, which I can expand on. Okay, part two, very briefly, gonna to touch on the, the B word, uh, Brexit, and just a couple of um, reflections on what might not be going so well with Brexit. So um, the, <laughs> the <clears throat> I just wanna concentrate on one thing. There's a piece of legislation going through the UK Parliament at the moment called the Data Protection and Digital Innovation Bill, uh, Digital Information Bill. It's the first big data protection legislation since the de, de, de facto Brexit. And I'm just going to focus on one part of that, which is sponsored by, by the Home Office. And essentially what it's trying to do is remove oversight for biometric and surveillance uh, activities. Uh, we have separate commissioners, which are now rolled into one individual under a piece of legislation listed there. And there is a discourse around simplifying oversight for for surveillance. And I think, you know, that that's a point of consensus in the UK that oversight event surveillance is very patchy, it crosses different different spheres and and, and it's quite difficult to navigate. Yet that's where the similarity ends. What this led, what this bill is proposing is basically to do away with all of the kind of the softer levers of regulation, fold some into the Data Protection Commission of the ICO or whatever that will become, uh, but the rest will just disappear with the hope that someone somewhere will do this regulatory work. Um, so, and then that sort of links to the the next point really that you know that surveillance oversight generally is overburdened and under-resourced there, there isn't you know it's it's limited and it's scant and what we do have generally in the uk a lot of for covert surveillance is different with the kind of the investigatory powers commissioner and and so on but in terms of overt surveillance and particularly biometric forms of overt surveillance there is really not very much of it and it's about to get eroded eroded further and reduced to an issue of of data protection which is which you know we can we can debate about the reach of data protection to cover the range of surveillance harms which i have views on um and i think the just sort of i think that sort of folds in the third point and in the interest of time i'll just skip to the last one that what's also contained in this this bill is the idea of really removing human scrutiny from automated decision making so i guess one way you could look at it is a move from human in the loop to human on the loop, I guess. So, but I think one of the really interesting things I've been struck with looking at how law enforcement use technologies like facial recognition and other sort of data driven technologies is this, uh, my own view is there's an overstatement in the belief of human scrutiny, that human in the loop is always used as this way of saying that this, this is an adequate form of uh, of regulation and oversight and for, for me i think that first of all that's a limited approach it's not sufficient it does it's, it, humans don't have the capability or don't have the institutional organizational freedom often to make those decisions so i can give hundreds of examples of examples but one was certainly on facial recognition operations i've been on for example where 
you know, the, the, a match comes through and it's always a judgment call, right? Particularly because you see an image from a custody image versus someone walking down the street and they're going to be different. So there's a level of, of scrutiny. Now, the amount of scrutiny that's given to that decision varies depending on organisational priorities, the time available. One operation I was on was in the, the centre of London, Leicester Square, just before Christmas. And if you didn't make a decision within like half, like two or three seconds, you'd lose the person. So, you know, decision making was there was a human in the loop, but it wasn't particularly very, very meaningful or effective. And and that's something we're, we're going to remove. So I think there needs to be sort of deeper thinking around that. And one of the, the deeper problems, I think, around discussions around human in the loop is it assumes there's this binary between the human and the technology that humans act in a very sort of context-free sp and objective space, which, you know, the whole canon, the whole history of the philosophy of science teaches us that, you know, that the humans shape, you know, technology, but also technology shapes human activity and behaviour as well. And that's me. Thank you. Thank you. That's well within time. <laughs> So now let's start moving into the direction of the EU. So, um, Helen, can you help us understand the data protection related lessons that can be drawn from comparing policing in the UK and the EU post Brexit? Yep, sure. So uh, I guess my perspective comes from kind of a applied research view. So I've spent most of the last 10 years working um, in sort of European based security projects. So although we're from the UK, um, a lot of our kind of work has been based in in the European Union and with the European Union uh, law enforcement agencies. Um, and so, you know, we've collaborated extensively with uh, law enforcement agencies, with border security experts, with first responders, looking into their kind of needs, uh, responsibilities, requirements for kind of operating technology, introducing solutions and the kind of data protection, privacy um, and other impacts that kind of come with that. Um, so by nature, really, um, Security research sits at the kind of uh, intersection between the operational needs of policing, but also the interests of researchers um, and their kind of desire to be at the forefront of innovation and various challenges. And we really see this kind of um, melding of two different two different worlds within security research. Um, and we've seen, I think, uh, within security research over the last ten years, I've definitely seen a much greater uh, sort of awareness, understanding growth, uh, both from the law enforcement side and from the researcher side in terms of understanding uh, privacy, data protection regulations, um, ethics, um, other kind of social factors. And I think, you know, that is something that's kind of been really beneficial in terms of what I've seen in, in the growth of that space. But obviously, there's still um, quite a way to go in that area. And I just kind of give two, two examples um, of where I've seen that recently. So we've been doing a lot of work with um, cybercrime investigators and digital forensic investigators looking at what their needs are around cloud services, around investigating cryptocurrencies, uh, investigating the dark web, um, investigating social engineering. And we see they bring up challenges all the time around encryption, um, around uh, de-anonymization or attribution of um, information and also kind of processing of large amounts of uh, information that re they receive from mobile devices and other services. Um, but actually in those sessions, we haven't seen a lot of kind of discussion of um, any data protection or privacy um, concerns. And we've also seen the same actually uh, looking in the border security area. So we've seen, um, we've been investigating solutions for um, protecting passengers on board passenger ships. And we've seen um, some of the people who've come from kind of a naval or kind of border security background been very much following the legislation of um, that the ship's master is in ultimate control of their ship. And it doesn't really matter if there's an incident, they have ultimate control and everyone can do whatever they want. And so some in some areas, we've been trying to bring a little bit more nuance to discussion to understand what um, factors might influence uh, a need for greater um, G, uh, GDPR or application of the law enforcement um, directive or other areas into those into those spaces. Um, and we see that it's uh, really difficult within research because research itself um, is designing for operational solutions, but it's also having to operate within its own uh, research framework as well. So we see that quite often the research is almost done twice. Um, so we see it a solution designed to run in the research project that complies with the GDPR, complies with all of the ethics uh, regulations, but then it also needs to um, 
be transferable into, into a solution that complies with what law enforcement's needs are. And I think as we kind of go on and see more and more um, artificial intelligence based solutions, we'll see this happening sort of more and more um, in the future. Um, but nonetheless, in terms of artificial intelligence itself, because we see that as such a important and uh, growing area, um, we know that this is going to come up again and again, uh, and we can use artificial intelligence for pre-processing and acquisition of data. We can also use it for kind of cleaning up and kind of bringing together um, and classifying initial pieces of data. And we also see it for kind of uh, more advanced uh, prediction and um, analytics-based approaches. And I think um, artificial intelligence is obviously going to be a major, major area, and it has a major impact on uh, data privacy. <coughs> Um, and we can see from one perspective that some, some uh, capabilities of AI may be slightly overstated. And we also see from some other perspectives that um, you know, some of the rigor in research might not be as high, as high as we would like it to be. And so we need to try to move towards um, various solutions that kind of uh, support an, both sides of, um, of the research and how we protect and improve data, data privacy. Um, and so we've kind of been looking initially at the set of data requirements, what would be required for law enforcement agencies, what would be required for researchers in order to um, effectively manage some of those um, solutions. So we've seen, um, again, a kind of sort of tension um, or maybe misalignment of uh, some of the perspectives. So, for example, I talked a little bit earlier about um, de-anonymization de um, and sort of attribution being a kind of a uh, key element um, of some law enforcement perspectives. But we also see when we start to move towards artificial intelligence-based development and solutions that actually anonymizing that data and making sure that um, it is either um, yeah, anonymized or pseudonymized um, is, is essential for, for people to be able to, to carry out their research uh, effectively. And that also has impact on operational um, sort of sensitivities that researchers can't necessarily be working with um, with live data, so how do we actually kind of manage all of those different um, processes? How do we develop trust between law enforcement and researchers so they can share data, but do it in a privacy uh, pre preserving way? And how can we also make sure that the solutions that researchers are developing are actually applicable and that they haven't had, for example, um, all of the relevant and most important or interesting information stripped out through the uh, anonymization procedures? Um, so this is something, you know, that we can continue to, to investigate and identifying potential solutions um, in order to, to solve some of those problems. Um, and then finally, we really looked into um, how to actually manage that process um, and how to, how to start to build up that trust uh, between law enforcement agencies and researchers um, and how we can kind of collaborate together to actually achieve um, kind of valuable and implementable and usable solutions so one of the projects uh, we've been working on and collaborating with Europol over the last sort of two, two and a half years has been the AP for AI project, uh, which looks at accountability principles uh, for artificial intelligence. And this um, kind of project was kind of born out of looking at how to manage uh, accountable AI, how, how, that, how can researchers um, have accountability, how can law enforcement agencies have accountability, how can industrial companies have accountability when they're developing their, uh, their, their specific solutions. Um, so we worked with a number of expert, uh, experts in the area from law enforcement, from industry, from technology, from uh, fundamental rights. We also worked with um, a number of citizens looking at various uh, stakeholders' <coughs> uh, opinions. Um, and we came up with 12 principles that uh, kind of allow, allow us to um, effectively identify and manage um, accountability within artificial intelligence. These were then uh, transformed and looked at in terms of how they appear across the AI, whole AI lifecycle. So is it in the design of the solutions? Is it in the development? Is it in the uh, procurement? Is it in the deployment? Is it in the monitoring? And how do each of those principles apply across those numerous areas? And then we looked at the implementation approach. So how can we actually implement these solutions and turn it into how can we actually implement those principles and turn it into something useful? So we started to develop a tool that helps with compliance and self-assessment and actually helps to deliver um, a, an approach for law enforcement agencies and for researchers in developing uh, accountable AI. 
Um, so just to kind of conclude from my side, um, security researchers you know, have to follow multiple rules to uh, design uh, regulations and work with regulations from national to EU to international um, to also their own internal management and work in different domains and sometimes they conflict or misalign and that can be a real challenge um, both in operational and research settings. Um, there's a lot more to be done in terms of anonymization um, and pseudonymization and other procedures in order to support researchers to access data sets to develop effective solutions. And finally, the AI, accountable AI for law enforcement in the, in, in the internal security sector um, can provide great benefits and shows a um, good opportunity for how research and law enforcement collaborate to develop and deliver solutions that really have uh, impact across the, the whole of the European Union. Thank you. The last piece of the puzzle is um, giving the word to European police cooperation. So how does Europol handle large amounts of data? Yeah, uh, thank you. Maybe just to, let's say, continue what was already started by all the speakers before. We should always remember here also in this panel, the title of the panel, which is Shine a Light which is from our understanding, bringing different perspectives into the data protection discussion. And then data protection and law enforcement in the digital age. I would like to focus on the end because it's not an or, or it's not if and, uh, on the one hand side, which is sometimes you can have the impression that this debate is then really uh, focused on, on the one hand side, we have law enforcement on the other hand side, data protection. I was happy that I could also attend this afternoon uh, two more panels. One was here uh, um, discussing the, um, let's say, use or also maybe extensive use of law enforcement of publicly available data, so open source intelligence. And the other panel just was discussion the interoperability agenda. And let's say one element I would like here to add simply to the discussion, which from my perspective was at least missing a bit, is when we talk about the digital age, and when we talk about that as a consequence of the digital age, we have to do simply with major information systems and devices like this, where simply thousands or maybe 10,000, 100,000 of data is stored on. This has not only an impact on the society, this has significantly changed the police work in the last decades. Sometimes it's good to be a bit older. Uh, so I'm now 38 years in the police and I can uh, tell you at the very beginning of my work, police was more running the risk that not enough data was there. And because of the lack of data, crime could not be prevented in an extreme sense, or maybe crime could not be investigated. Latest, I would say, by the beginning of the 2000s, the police has exactly the opposite problem. There is massive amount of data available, which is, and this I would like to reiterate because it is also sometimes forgotten in the debate, always collected under judicial evidence, uh, judicial oversight, is always collected under legislation, which is nowadays also at EU level, always developed by the European Parliament, by the Commission, by the Council, always with the involvement of data protection and always with the involvement of fundamental rights. So let's say in the legislative development, there's, I would say, already a solid framework. You can, of course, question the one other detail of, of the law, but as such, I think also a law process is quite solid. So when it comes to Europol, it's not that we can investigate in a classical sense, so meaning that we do house searches that can arrest people, but we support the member states' law enforcement agencies by processing uh, data, by doing analysis work. And there I would like to highlight simply how this work of the police in the last years have changed um, in order also to reflect that is nowadays, you could have questioned this maybe in the past, but nowadays data protection the data minimization principle is at the core of the police work for the following reasons. First, this has to do with two challenges which are mainly for us at Europol, but I think also for the Europol police in, uh, in Europe, uh, the main challenges, if you talk about investigations, is how to access data. And if we can access the data, I will say if, if the technology, uh, technology possibilities are given, how to manage the data, what we access. So the first thing, I mentioned this already, is that law enforcement operates always under strict judicial oversight. We cannot just access private devices because we think it would be good to access data. 
It is always done uh, following um, principles of fundamental rights and, and data protection. So under specific conditions, which are clearly defined in the law, of course, police can access data in theory. But this was an element which was existing always in police work. In the past, let's say a judge was, for example, um, issuing a, a house search and was allowing, for example, police to go into the house to have a search in maybe the office of the house and to seize then some files that are there. Nowadays, I would say our intellectual house, our information house is in, in there. So if you would like that police is still able under special judicial oversight to access this house, then that means in practice that also practically you would have the chance to access this house, which is about the possibility to decrypt encrypted data or literally translated into other words. Um, in former times, the police was happy if they had the key to the house. Um, there were possibilities um, if there was no key to smash the door of the house. This is in the digital world not any longer possible. So you will have to talk about the encryption and decryption tools that should be uh, developed um, together. Again, always under the strict application of law enforcement um, needs, but at the same time, and this is the end, in full respect of data protection and fundamental rights, which have to be developed for developing these tools together. And one example was just mentioned uh, by my colleague over here. So when police is accessing then the data, then normally and you should also ask yourself how many data you have on this phone. And I think it was also mentioned in one of the panels before, even if this is a phone of a criminal, there might be complete uh, vast amounts of unnecessary data, which is also, even though that it was belonging for police, not of relevance for the police work. So this has something to do with how do we manage then the vast amount of data. And this is, um, this is uh, crucial. And I would like to mention two examples uh, for you from the recent two years where we simply also luckily made the experience how, let's say, organized criminals are operating nowadays. The one, one was the so-called Sky ECC case and the other is the EncroChat case. Both names are simply names for decrypted platforms, communication platforms, which were mainly used by criminals. This turned out, let's say, after the investigation started, to give you some idea, the one platform was hosting 60,000 criminals, the other <coughs> one 70,000 criminals. So give you an idea about how massively also these encrypted platforms um, are um, used. And so the first challenge was to decrypt the, the platforms to have access and then to, of course, follow the criminal communication, which is then also highlighting what happens in the real world of the criminals. And that was, let's say, the success story to have the possibility in both cases to uh, decrypt these platforms, to follow the communication, and also by this then also to, in, uh, to start massive investigations. And just to give you again, there are some figures. That means that in the one case, something like 6,000 criminals of organized cr crime groups were arrested. In other sense, uh, something like 3,000 investigations started, at least against organized criminals. And by this, and this is the, 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 the aim where police is aiming for, uh, something close to 1 billion uh, criminal assets seized, beside the fact that hundreds of tons of, uh, of drugs were seized. So this is, let's say, the success story. But what we also have learned out of these investigations was, for example, in the Sky ECC, we had to analyze 1 billion communication messages. 1 billion. You can imagine that this is simply not possible to do it manually. And this is also be mentioned, the aim of police work is still to be preventive. So the first thing that Europol had to do is out of the 1 billion messages to find out, and this is also part of the organized crime, if there were contract killings, if there were serious harm planned against criminals, you could say, let's say from the overall perspective, well, this is criminals, uh, let them shoot each other. But from a human perspective, and you see it sometimes in some countries, what are the, the effects of this? One country where you saw it in the last years was Sweden, unfortunately, where these contract killings, these shootings, really had a massive impact on the, on the uh, social uh, society and the security feeling in this country, with sometimes also political consequences even. So it's the aim also of the police to prevent also these killings. So we had to filter out something like 200 planned contract killings out of this massive amount of information. This need, uh, has to be done in a speedy way. We can, uh, you cannot uh, leave this uh, data simply there and, uh, and wait um, until something happens. And 
This can only be done, and here we're at the, the element was just mentioned, uh, with the help of artificial intelligence. And that is the next thing I think we clearly need here, the clear debate. What is exactly behind this sometimes mystified name of artificial intelligence? This is not, and I think this was also mentioned in one of the panels before, this is not the minority you're reporting that, uh, that uh, some technical tool will somehow uh, lead to, to some forecast of crime. This is simply a technical filter, a technical filter that will help the analysts, the criminal investigator, to, let's say, have a pre-selection between data which is necessary and data which is unnecessary. This is a technical tool that helps the investigator, and this technical tool will never ever, at least not in the next years, visible, make a decision in which way investigation should be run. It enables the police investigator to use his or her cognitive skills to focus on really police work, and this is a precondition for, for police work, uh, which also was visible under these um, this, um, investigations we were supporting. This leads to, uh, to uh, let's say, my final remarks, what has to be done, let's say, from a police perspective. It's about the, to, to have a clear debate about what, what is necessary from a data protection point of view, what is necessary from a human point of view, what is necessary to guarantee also, which is also a human right, security for citizens in Europe, and to find there the good balance, or I would say even a complementary uh, situation. And there we're also proud at Europol that we do this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, this uh, complementarity is part of our job. And I think that, in particular, one of the challenges in the future is to develop these artificial intelligence tools. As just mentioned here, we have this AP4 AI project. And uh, you just presented uh, the principles which were developed. But again, what is the practical consequence of this? The practical consequence of this project might be, and there we're working intensively on, that this will help police forces, again, to cross-check the implementation of the Artificial Intelligence Act, which is about to be adopted, uh, which has some complex requirements for police in it. And this we have also to uh, respect as police because w the legislator determines what is allowed for police to be done. But we believe if we can apply these 12 principles and if we can do something like a checklist for police and if we have in the debate and we have in the debate, for example, also involved the fundamental rights agency, the data protection, and if we agree that if certain kind of quality criteria are always applied if police is developing artificial intelligence, then I believe we will be also able to... to, um, to follow the technical challenges and to be faster. This is, this is one of the elements I would say where we definitely, and there we have a good uh, conversation also with the EPS on this, we have to be faster from the side of the police to involve always at the very beginning, but also during the whole process, the uh, data protection people, the fundamental rights people, but at the same time, we also have to be faster to approve if we make a DPIA or if we make a data protection impact assessment, that we also have then the need to approve, um, let's say, the necessary tools, because again, when it comes to criminal investigations and threat to life situations, it's about to also to be fast, but precise. And this is an element, and this I really appreciated by one of the speakers of the data protection panel before on the interoperability agenda, she had uh, said, we have to think here in this sense also holistic. That is, of course, a buzzword to think holistic, but a holistic thinking nowadays is definitely also from a data protection side not to focus, let's say, on nitty-gritty details, not to focus on the silo approach, not to focus on a data, on an IT infrastructure, which was maybe applicable in the 80s and 90s, but really to think about in a systematic approach what a tool should deliver, what kind of principles this tool should uh, guarantee in order exactly to guarantee the fundamental and, and um, uh, civil rights and the data protection rights. And then we believe, together, we, the police, the data protection and the human rights representative will be then able to find the necessary measures to protect at the one hand side the data protection needs and rights of citizens of Europe, which is also unique in the world, but at the same time also to guarantee for the same people also security in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. I'm sure that there are plenty of questions in the audience. Let me 
just to warm you up, let me ask one question to the entire panel. In the meantime, you can start thinking about how to phrase your question. Um, we've been talking about data gathering and data processing and AI now and different types of technologies, but AI has come up quite often. Um, this brings up questions of surveillance. And when we speak of surveillance, we also speak of trust. Trust from the public in technology trust from the public in law enforcement also, and in all forms of authority. So what I was thinking here, something you often hear of trust, is that trust is gained in drops and it's lost in buckets. So I want to ha have one question uh, that I want every panelist to, to give their reflections on. How does law enforcement keep or regain trust in, in, in its way of working and in its use of technology? Walter, do you want to be the first to say something <laughs> about that? <coughs> right from the start. So I will, I will, I will look at your question from my prevent mm -hmm. team point of view, right? So I won't speak for law enforcement generally, but looking at the offender prevention, we have this discussion quite often because um, there are many different types of risk groups that we could focus on. And if you don't focus on risk groups, but on the general public, you can focus on everyone. So, and we could do, we come up with interventions that we're not allowed to do by laws, by the prosecutor's office. So we have this discussion daily. And what we try to do um, is, if it's in the justice, if, if, it's, if it's in the criminal uh, law, then we have to check with prosecutor with the prosecutor's office and we uh, that's what we do with our interventions and as they are often new we speak to them on a daily basis and that's if it's in if we draw the the, the offender in that uh, criminal uh, area otherwise I try I think we try to always keep our interventions uh, voluntarily basically if we are focusing on youngsters it's voluntarily if it's on high schools um, it's anonymous, people don't have to do it, which is not always the case with law enforcement. But if we especially focus on primary, secondary prevention, so people, we can't, we can't show that people committed the crime, it's voluntarily. It should always be that way, I guess. That's what we try with prevent okay. activities. Does that answer your question? It does. Right? Yeah. Just right. a reflection from your side. Yeah. Pete, what do you think of trust and how can law enforcement Enforce? Uh, sorry, not enforce. Strengthen the trust. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I'll come at from the woolly academic side. Um, if you talk about the sort of moral philosophy of of trust, Nora O'Neill's sort of concept. On, I mean, it's a fairly standard thing to say, I guess, that you know, if, in order to gain trust, you have to be trustworthy, and that's a, that's a foundational principle in in the UK, the city I live in, in London. I think there's, it's fair to say there's a crisis of legitimacy and trust in the police at the moment. So what that really demonstrates, I think, is there is a bit of a halo effect in relation to technology. It depends on not just the technology and, and all of the, sort of the, the implications of its use and, and restricting its harm, potential harms, but also the trustworthiness of the organisation um, that's using it. And those two things are, are fundamentally inter interdependent, I would say. Helen, what do you think of trust and law enforcement? Sure. So um, I think from my perspective, one of the main things is that, you know, law enforcement need to be advocates for themselves in terms of demonstrating what they're, they're doing. They can't rely on the, the media, for example, to present uh, them in a trustworthy manner or present the everything in the best light. They need to be, you know, proactive and on the front foot. So even if they're doing you know, projects like AP for AI, making sure that actually some of that information is reaching, uh, you know, the public knowledge and actually um, presented in a way that, you know, helps to build that trust and demonstrates what that's actually, what taking those approaches have actually achieved. So also demonstrating outcomes from, from uh, the ways that they have acted in a trustworthy manner. Thank you. You can? Yeah, maybe from my side, um, first not to challenge what you said, uh, but, um, but I would say at least those, uh, let's say, surveys I know, at least in the European Union, but also in mem many member states, if you compare professions next to each other, the profession, when it comes to trust, which is always going as one of the highest in the EU, is the police. So I would say police as such has a baseline of trust. 
and I'm fully uh, also in line with uh, here Peter Fossey, that scandals, of course, can heavily damage this trust, be it uh, of misuse of powers, be it of violating of rights, be it of, let's say, human scandals in the police, that can have, of course, a negative impact. So what, what is necessary for police is to maintain the trust and to strengthen the trust. And this can be done, I think, in this digital age, if we develop these tools we were just discussing in a very transparent way that you always can demonstrate. And this is not only because of the, for the citizens, but this is, uh, this is uh, the main also purpose also that is also very clear and transparent in court, that what kind of artificial intelligence are used, for what purposes, what is the process, so that there's no black boxes in this. And to be it also very clear, I think we have to do it at European soil. Because one thing is clear, if you use a black box developed somewhere in China, then it might be not that easy to exactly understand what this box is doing. And that, that calls really for European solutions. And when it comes for the European police as such, I would say trust can be gained and maintained and maybe strengthened if we can offer solutions, which find the right balance about that what every individual, and I'm also a child of the 70s, so I'm really uh, into protecting my individual rights and my data protection rights. So I won't then have to protect it, but I would like to live also in a secure Europe. And this balance has to be demonstrated that Europe is, is able to find solutions which are not only to be found at national level, but some criminality, and I think this is self explanatory international serious and organized crime needs at least a European, if not even an international approach. And there we have to demonstrate solutions. And there these solutions have to be developed under uh, full transparency in full respect of all these rights. Okay. Very brief reaction from Peter, now we move to... Yeah, just quickly, <clears throat> just quickly to respond, I think I agree with pretty much everything you said, Jürgen. The only point, I'd, uh, and also the way in which particular scandals kind of erode such trust that's been hard built for, for many years. The only thing I, I would slightly add or advance really is when we talk about these things like trust and legitimacy, often they're talked about in a very utilitarian way. You know, most people will support certain uses of technology or whatever, but there's... You know, that's the whole principle of a human rights based approach is actually the, it's the rights of the people who are on the margins of society, the minoritized groups where legitimacy and trust is less. So sort of differentiating trust um, in relation to social location, I think, is, is really, really important and not having a very high sort of granular utilitarian sense of what trust is. Great. Thank you. We have uh, one person uh, ready for asking a question. Please uh, yeah, tell right. us if you want to ask the question to the entire panel or to someone, someone specific. Um, I think it's a question to the entire panel. My name is Jaapen Koopman from the Netherlands. Um, you were talking about trust and um, I think the, uh, the last member of the, pa the panel was um, discussing, uh, for instance, access to encrypted communication uh, as a tool that would be necessary to um, fight certain kind of crimes and your examples of anchor chat and, and, and other examples um, were presented, and um, what I think is, is, is a sort of fundamental problem in this discussion is that on the one hand, um, we do not want a, soci a society where the poli police is blind. Um, on the other hand, we also do, do not want a police that is almighty. And the problem with a lot of the proposals that are being put on the table using AI or using or getting access to encrypted communications the moment that these tools are in the hand of the law enforcement agencies, because of the scalability of these tools, these tools give the, the law enforcement agents, agencies incredible amounts of power compared to what they were able to do 30 years ago, as you mentioned, with, with, with much more limited resources. So the problem is that by proposing these kind of tools, um, there is no inherent limitation to the applicability except for oversight or transparency, which, you know, given given the, the risk of a, a function and feature creep, doesn't really give warm, fuzzy feelings and actually might, in the end, lead to erosion of trust uh, in, in what the law enforcement agencies are doing. So I, I invite the panel to reflect on that dilemma, like, how do you, what, what kind of like, what kind of like weapons do you really want to have and how powerful do you really want to be and are you willing to constrain yourselves in, in a certain sense in order to be more trustworthy? Thank you. That's a very important question. Uh, can we go down the panel again? 
Walter, do you want yeah, to yeah, reflect thinking, on yeah, yeah, sorry, what I'm weapons thinking, and what power I'm, would you like um, to have? Almighty. <laughs> almighty <laughs> Thor. Um, if we're talking about different new interventions, I think you have to keep in mind that we need to keep that division of prosecution office uh, the trios politica we need to keep that in place i guess for our interventions and it's very tempting sometimes to use all the data and to knock on all the doors and to do a cease and desist with everyone we can find as long as the the the, the, the prosecutor doesn't allow us to do that i think we're safe uh, if we if we keep looking at from that angle if i just look at our our, our approach to the problem with offender prevent um it's nothing new I guess, although also, although it's very tempting, I have to say, it's true. Um, so people have to control us, I guess. Stick within those laws, and if the laws don't apply, don't do it before we can apply them, I guess. That's for something like offender prevention, which is fairly new. That's our one of our first rules, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Compliance and oversight. Yeah. Yeah, and if we don't have the law yet, don't do it yet. Also, although it's very tempting sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I agree with all of that. It's, it's very interesting from a UK perspective, certainly the work I was doing on facial recognition at the different um, speeds of rollout um, in, in different parts of, uh, of Europe, depending on the, the clarity of the legal basis. I mean, just to answer explicitly, so I think, you know, it's fairly uncontroversial to say that the police are upholding the law so they should operate within the law. I mean, that's kind of fairly straightforward thing to say. But then I would add to that that the complexity comes, particularly in common law jurisdictions, over the extent and reach of the common law in legitimating and, and enabling certain forms of, of data collection or, or surveillance. And where is the point where an explicit legal basis is needed, given the intrusive nature of, of what they're trying to do? So I think that's a real battle, battleground, is the, the sort of delineation between an implicit and an explicit uh, legal basis in common law jurisdictions, I'd say. Um, so yeah, so I guess from a more technological perspective, I think there's also um, an argument to be made that, you know, a lot of the tools that are deployed are actually, you know, trying to reduce the data, the data overload. So a lot of the tools are trying to reduce down and actually find um, and triage some of the some of the data that is received. So um, I think there's also this side of the perspective. Not all tools out there are going out to kind of gather um, more data. A lot of them are actually trying to reduce reduce the pile and kind of um, not so much exactly find the needle in the haystack but at least you know find a pointer on where to start um, start looking so it's kind of also advantages in that side um, for some of the some of the tools yeah maybe from my side um, sorry uh, I have a different opinion than my Dutch colleague um, at least those um, police forces I know the best the German police and the Europol are not tempted to use uh, technical tools just to explore whatever data this is definitely not not the case so we are not tempted to use tools that are given to us under specific legal conditions this is the debate we have to go through we have to debate what are artificial intelligence tools which can be applied under which conditions and then i'm fully convinced uh, and this is i think in all european member states the same case that these tools cannot be simply applied by the police by just using these tools this can be, in our case, only applied, uh, again, under judicial oversight, if we investigate in serious and organized crime, if we investigate against terrorism, if we investigate against, uh, against cyber crime in the more heavily sense, including child sex exploitation. And if it's about to prevent something happening, then of course I would like to make um, use of these tools, for example, to find out, and this is for example some of the tools where we're talking also about how to use video, for example, also to find out where is the child misused, because very often you just unfortunately don't know this. And there you need artificial intelligence tools, for example, to identify objects in a video, which can give you at least a glimpse where this child is uh, abused. And they would like to use this uh, tool in order to, to, to save the child in that uh, sense. And this I would do. I'm not, uh, definitely not my personally, but I think also at least those police officers I know, they don't want to be al almighty. That is, not, that is not the case. And uh, the police work nowadays, and I hope this was clear in, in my presentation, is driven by the need 
to minimize data as soon as possible in order to solve a case, in order to prevent a case based on data that really can help to solve this. This is not about unnecessary collecting data. And also the debate about um, uh, whether there might be by using video, uh, video or photos um, in a certain kind of um, surveillance perspective, it's simply not, it's simply not uh, the, the case that is debated. The, the, the police using artificial intelligence tools is talk about to talk about using data in rest, not data in traffic, but to compare, for example, a photo of a criminal with a database which has a lot of photos. So this is also something to be done by artificial intelligence tools. And from that perspective, I'm convinced if we have the right legislation, and this is a, this is a, a society-based debate, where society has to decide what is acceptable, what not. If we have this legislation in place and if we have the balance of power, which I think is in our democratic society very well established, and if then police under specific conditions can apply these tools, then uh, we are, I think, also on the safe side that these tools are not misused and by this also public trust is maintained. Thank you. We are within our last two minutes, so let's see if we can, uh, you were first, so let's take you first and then uh, see if we can get to you in the back. Okay, thank you very much for uh, receiving my question. Uh, to build further on the trust and in law enforcement, uh, a specific question to uh, the member of the Netherlands, the COPS. Um, how do you make sure that data collected for, for prevention purposes, purposes, for example, the IP address to which an advertisement has been sent so to deter someone from engaging in a DDoS attack is not in future used or to build a profile around that person for other purposes. So um, how do you make sure that that function is not creeped? Is the, the data rightly deleted after the adver advertisement has been sent? Uh, which other safeguards are there in either Dutch or European law to deter I should say, the police for using it for other purposes. Because for prevention purposes, the, the, the attacker in the future has not yet attacked. So absolutely. Thanks. how do you make sure that does not happen? Yeah, good question. And I think that was my point for the previous question, that indeed we can collect this data fairly easily. Uh, and then sometimes it's tempting not to do more because indeed we don't know if this person actually did commit crime. Um, the simple answer is we, at least for my team, speaking for my team, Google Ads, we don't collect it. We simply don't store it. We don't measure it. And uh, we are, two weeks ago, I was uh, with, with Els in the panel discussing collaborations between scientists and law enforcement. and. As what we're doing is fairly new and uh, we have the prevent paradox. We can't explain and show that what we did made sure that something didn't happen, right? So we have to work together with scientists and we have to evaluate what we're doing if it's effective. And this is the big frustration because we absolutely don't collect all the data. So then if we don't collect it, we can't misuse it because we are very much aware that if we collect it now and somebody clicked on that ad to see uh, because he or she was Googling a DDoS attack, the free DDoS or the top nine DDoS attacks, uh, top DDoS tools uh, in, in 2023, uh, that's nothing criminal indeed. So we don't collect it. Same goes for uh, having an account on certain platforms. It doesn't make you criminal. And um, we might want to do a knock and talk with you or a cease and desist, come to your door, explain the risks of committing crime. We, if we're not allowed to use that data. And that's often difficult because we collect data for one purpose, for one specific investigation. And uh, this doesn't allow us to use this data to do a voluntary debrief, for example, to learn more about the problem. So we don't do it because we're not allowed to. Uh, long answer, but the short answer is we simply don't collect it if we're not allowed to. Okay. Do we have a short final question, Maria Grazia? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try. Uh, also for the same speaker, well, thank you to all of the speakers for <laughs> your, your amazing talks. Um, um, very interesting to hear about the 4D and the frame um, initiatives. I was wondering if you're collecting information or data about whether frame is working in, you know, sort of preparing, however, you know, bearing in mind the prevent paradox um, in, in, in deterring kids from uh, engaging in cybercrime. 
I'm also wondering if you're collecting information about when a cybercrime, when a kid engaged in cybercrime, how easy the technology, how easy it was to break into the technology. So I'm wondering whether you're monitoring how your frame approach uh, is faring in terms of maybe deterring children, kids from engaging in cybercrime, but also if you're monitoring if the technology that kids hacked into, for instance, was actually really easy to break into. So are you, are you, keeping, are you keeping track of both sides, if that makes sense? So, so, okay, first question, if we uh, measure frames. Uh, frames, we only measure how much time it's played per year. So we uh, every every October there's the week of cybersecurity in Netherlands, and then we promote it around all the schools, and then we just check how many people played it within the schools. It's sort of this less pro lesson program for one one hour, so it helps teachers to to talk about cybercrime, right, and the risks. I think that's your first question, right? So would it be the 4D then that gets monitored? So your your integrated strategy no, no. towards. So the 4D we use to come up with interventions to focus them. It's sort of our method that we build interventions around. And there's no one intervention with all the 4Ds in it because somebody who is need, needed to be deterred does not, does not need to be disrupted, for example. So that's the method how we make our interventions or how we focus our interventions. That's the combination of that 4D together with that pathway. What was your second question? The second question was a bit provocative. I'm, as, I'm, I'm asking whether you ever monitor how easy it was to break into the technology because you know a lot of a lot of kids uh, you know a lot of kids breaking into tech are hmm. really breaking into insecure tech but, but it's such a low hanging fruit you know so many cyber crimes committed by kids True. involve really low hanging fruits but then is your point that because it's so easy that it's should, should that we should not look at it or that no, 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 no. I was just wondering whether you're monitoring how easy it was to break into technology, whether that's ever part of the assessment. Uh, for frames, you mean? No, not specifically. We do make an assessment uh, for the reboot camp. I have, I didn't go into it. It's okay. a one day event, and then we have this assessment with challenges. And then if they reach all the way at the end, they're super hackers. That's how we measure it sometimes. And then they get an, a voluntary invitation. I'll take this, you know, you know I'll, I'll, I'll keep <laughs> We can continue. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. No worries. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. I'm sure that you can continue this uh, during the drinks, this discussion. Thank you to all the panelists, because I, sorry, we went a little bit over time, because I'm sure this gave you a lot of food for thought to discuss during the drinks uh, that I'm sure served upstairs. Thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, thank you so much to everybody uh, who engaged with this panel. And thank you to Eden and Europol for organizing this. Have a good night. Thank you.